Hi, Amruta. Thank you so much for the introduction. And yeah, I, I shouldn't thank Meteorological Association of India for you know uh, asking me to present this talk. So yeah, like uh, Amrita said, I'm one of the co-founders of Speleological Association of India, and I'm very glad that I'll be talking about coastal caves today. Like they are one of my favorite types of caves, and uh, from the initiating, like from the beginning of my career, coastal caves were the like first type of caves I was like introduced to. So yeah, I'm very glad. Uh, thank you again, Amrita. Uh, I'll be just switching off my video for a while. So is my screen visible? Uh, can anybody just confirm? Yeah, it's visible. Cool then. Yeah, so again, good evening to everyone. So I'm here to talk about underexplored and unexplored habitats of coastal caves. Yeah. So yeah, so coming to the you know most uh, understudied habitat, like overall are caves. So uh, what are exactly caves? So if we can define them in very simple words, so they are natural cavity in the ground. This is what every layman can understand. And anthropologically, uh, a very common definition is introduced on international level, which is like uh, caves are natural cavity in the ground, which are which should be large enough for human to enter. So like uh, you can see these pictures. So I mean, these are evident that humans can enter such caves. And so, yeah, so maybe that's why this definition was formed. So basically, these beautiful structures are formed due to weathering and dissolution of rocks. So as you can see in this picture, uh, so for example, uh, this is a cast land, uh, basically of limestone, or it can be dolomite also, any other type of any other type of cast. So if in this process you see, you can see that carbonic acid in groundwater dissolves the limestone over here and basically from forms cracks. Then uh, what happens is uh, it keeps on weathering and dissoluting the uh, like underground limestone and forming such kind of uh, cavities which you can see are like half filled with water and half like are uh, empty so what happens in this process is water table the groundwater table is lowered and you can see these hollow cavities which are formed basically are caves and the final stage what happens is finally the entire limestone gets dissolved and the rocks above the caves is like deposited like the carbonate uh, acid, carbonic acid keeps on dissoluting the limestone, and then you can see these beautiful features called stalactites and stalagmites. So yeah, so this looks like a very simple process in picture, but this this takes around like millions of years uh, to you know to make an entire whole habitat. So uh, yeah, the study of caves uh, is speleology, and the study of life inside caves, which includes flora, fauna, everything, fungi, is called biospeleology. So yeah, like what I meant to say by the anthropological definition is this. So because we were able to enter caves, we could become cave people. Yeah, so I, I'll just uh, quickly um, introduce you to what type of microhabitats are there in the caves. So basically, when we think of a cave, we the first thing which comes in our mind is darkness. So basically, the light is the major important factor which decides the zonation inside caves. So the first zone obviously is the entrance zone, as the name suggests. Entrance means the first zone of the cave, where sunlight can be directly seen, and you can see flora and a lot of floral diversity in the first zone. Then there are a lot of variations in temperature and humidity because it is obviously affected by the outside temperature, and uh, is majorly occupied by accidental or facultative fauna. So for example, even uh, large mammals, large cats, like big cats do use entrance zones and predators such as owls and any other organism can just enter the cave uh, and in the entrance zone for uh, for taking shelter then uh, basically second second zone is twilight again as the name suggests is there's no direct sunlight but there's a dim light so there is no floral life so suddenly you can see that every zone uh, like one by one will you know have little little fauna like it won't have much fauna and coming to the dark, then you'll have like specialized uh, organisms. So in twilight, you have, uh, yeah, so it's like a transit zone. So animals can move around. Like a lot of times we have seen uh, animals from dark zone coming to twilight zone for foraging 
or entering zone animals also coming into twilight zone for foraging so it's basically a good transit uh, zone then uh, coming to dark zone actually there is one more zone uh, but uh, traditionally three zones are defined so the fourth zone actually is a deep dark zone so in dark and deep dark zone basically there is no light absolute no light like zero light uh, the temperature is known to be constant and humidity is also constant and it's totally unaffected by the elements like there's obvious reasons to it and yeah they have it has less oxygen as you guys must have seen the thai rescue part so when the children were uh, like rescued from the dark zone there were like there was like very less oxygen for them to breathe also so yeah this is like obvious in all the caves like dark zones have very uh, stringent uh, what do we say microclimatic uh, characters and yes uh, they are they are occupied by obligate cave fauna uh, like you must have seen uh, the entire white creatures which have uh, deep pigmentation and lack of eyes so for example the recently the largest fish the largest blind fish was discovered from meghalaya so yeah such kind of creatures are found in dark zones coming to animals in caves like i have already given you a brief but then there is a universally followed uh, way where we classify cave animals so based on their presence inside which zone they they belong so they are troglozoans troglophiles and troglobites so like there's no there much need to uh, make you understand there because then in next coming slides i'll be coming back to these things so uh, everybody uh, must be wondering that you know in each habitats like forest wetland or anything there are a lot of energy sources for the organisms to to survive so what happens exactly in the cave these are dark and how how do these organisms survive so the first thing is water water is essential for all the organisms so the percolating water like i showed in the uh, earlier slide that the carbonic acid and the limestone it keeps on dissoluting so there's a lot of uh, water percolation inside caves always so this all, all helps a lot of uh, stygofauna or microarthropods to survive then we have flowing water so in india a uh, lot of uh, rivers have been originated from like caves they are also called as like subterranean wetlands so for example uh, we have this river gupta godavari in uh, uttar pradesh or madhya pradesh I, i confused about it but yeah some of the state and there the river has been originated so there are a lot of there are a lot of caves in india where we have uh, flowing water uh, third is like wind and gravity obviously help to get lot of uh, like fallen leaves twigs and aerially dispersing invertebrates inside caves which uh, form like very important part of the food chain then there are tree roots uh, from the surface layers and th then there is like active movement of animals and then guano which is very important like uh, bats we understand there are keystone species of uh, caves so the their accumulation of feces is basically one of the most energy sources in dried caves so why are these habitats uh, important uh, one is they have ecological values they are shelter to lot of uh, different specialized and generalist organisms second is socio economic value in india and outside india like everywhere there are lot of show caves and there's lot of nature and geo tourism going on so for example this picture i have shared is of uh, nainital eco cave garden which is in nainital yeah so this this is the blind cave fish which i was telling you about which was uh, found from meghalaya so the there are a lot of geological values so for example uh, this uh, portion of a stalagmite was uh, taken from a meghalayan cave and uh, with the help of carbon dating it was found that right now we are in the meghalayan age so caves um, ha have a lot of uh, geological uh, value to them then there are hydrological values as i suggested yeah so gupta godavari is in uttar pradesh and it's an origin of a, of this river and then there are a lot of aquifers also inside caves so we also have archaeological and cultural significance like we, everybody know in in the in our entire lifetime we have definitely visited to to, to uh, a at least at least one cave temple so for example amarnath is the most famous uh, cave temple but uh, very less people know that it's an ice cave and it's like 46 kilometers long and yeah so it has a lot of religious and cultural significance and one of the most uh, like historically if we say that there are a lot of uh, pandava caves in konkan 
like in maharashtra in western maharashtra so these hold a lot of historical importance and significance to each and every geo sites so yeah coming to the actual thing now so basically uh, according to my knowledge uh, there are about like more than 50 levels of classification of caves like for example i have just mentioned a few over here so if you see this chart so here you can see there are a lot of caves which are based, these are caste and pseudo caste caves i i, do, I won't go too much deep into caste and pseudo caste right now because it's an entire different topic of discussion but yeah i'll be talking about these caves and how that class classified so uh, there are it can be classified basically for example starting from the surface level this is the most easiest to understand so some caves are like above ground caves and some are underground so as this picture you can see this whatever entrance you will see from above the ground above the surface they they are called as above ground and which like you can see this is like a 10 meter deep entrance and yeah so these are like underground then coming to origin basis on origin caves can be classified as like pit cave flank margin cave banana hole and lot of others so one of my most favorite uh, which i'm like obsessed about is flank margin cave so uh, i just brief you guys up in this is so for example we always have two layers of water in in the marine um, landscape so see if this is a ocean and we have two lenses over here so uh, the one is marine ground water and one is fresh water so fresh water because it's lighter lighter than marine water it will always float so this lens will always float so uh, mixing and erosion at this point where the land and these lenses meet so millions of years the erosion keeps on happening and then flank margin caves uh, they are formed so basically these are uh, these are kind of repositories of past information of where the fresh water lens is and where it was millennia ago so these are one of one of the most important uh, type of coastal caves which are like which, which are classified according to their origin coming to ecological network so nowadays the speleological community is also considering it was considering earlier also but now it's been talked about more so caves are also called to be um, ecological networks so basically uh, they are defined as to be two types one is lattice which is like system of patches so you can see there are two caves or four caves or six caves which are connected to each other and then you can see there are dendritic networks dendritic networks which are primary habitats there, there is no connectivity with other caves but then there are a lot of tunnels and lot of uh, kind of stems Uh, going on on and uh, each of the each of these networks form a very different habitat to very different uh, animals then uh, one type of classification is on based on number of chambers and stories so for example uh, such kind of caves are like there in meghalaya so kind of there are a lot of lot of chambers and multi so these are multi stories and multi chamber uh, things so there are a lot of levels and yeah so there are a lot of levels of uh, chambers which have which again will have different type of fauna and lot of times there is an under, underground river and the water flowing from there that so that is like um, there are a lot of cave waterfalls inside and then meeting the underground river and this river then forms part of a bigger uh, water system in an area so uh, coming to classification based on microclimate so this is a very finest example which are barometric caves barometric caves are where the pressure differs so this is a typical setup of a barometric cave so i had uh, like i had entered one barometric cave in andamans uh, while working uh, under under the edible nest shifted project so here if you if you enter and if you enter like you see you can see that we are entering this part and the moment we reach here immediately there is like the t- the pressure the barometric pressure it changes so uh, this is how a setup is and here you will find very different type of uh, fauna because uh, not all the animals will be in a position to adapt themselves to very low pressures or very high pressures yeah coming to wetlands so basis on is the basis on the presence and absence of water inside a cave whether it is flowing or whether whether it is stagnant or whichever type of a presence we can we can call them as subterranean wetlands so yeah so these are basically coastal hypogene habitats they are also called as coastal aquifers and subterranean estuaries basically ice caves are also uh, come in the category of 
subterranean wetlands and yeah my favorite sea and littoral caves can sometimes can also have coastal like marine water in them and can be stated as subterranean wetlands based on location yeah so yeah this is easy to understand so this cave this one is a example of an inland cave and this this is a picture of coastal cave so you can see this is like a terrace this is called a coastal terrace and in the coastal terrace you will always get to see five six uh, coastal caves so you can see the cave openings from here so this is again in andaman islands yeah so um, i i have a lot of things to say but then i've cut it down to two case studies uh, like where where i was part of so one was uh, in the andaman islands and the second was like amruta mentioned in the konkan region of uh, maharashtra so yeah so the this case case study was like uh, documentation of coastal cast forms on the interview island so interview island basically is the uh, largest uh, wildlife sanctuary in andaman island so the, like the basis of area and is a uh, like it's a it's a place where you can still see feral elephants in andaman yeah so coming to the documentation of coastal cast forms so uh, we could identify six types of um, coastal cast forms so for example if you can see the first picture this is this is phytocast this is also called called as photocarin and basically a jagged forms so this can be dead coral also and over the years the corals must have been uh, placed in just one place and then there are total jagged forms of the coral or the stone and they have like these penetrating holes and these penetrating holes you will be surprised that you we get to see a lot of uh, gastropoda and lot of other diversity of life inside these uh, small holes second are limestone outcrops so limestone outcrops is basically like i said it's uh, visible exposure of bedrocks this i'm going to uh, explain more in the upcoming slides so won't discuss here more then third are the bio constructions we have, we know that corals are there and yeah so corals are part of bio constructions they are biologically driven and they are very unique to coastal cast cast as in the limestone so like andamans are carbonate island so we get to see this limestone coastal cast in andamans then fourth you can see is coastal karen so these are like irregular pits and very pointed ridges and basically these are also residual consider when we consider a landscape a coastal landscape these are also said to be residual part of uh, the cast land then uh, yeah so we have coastal terraces like i said uh, these are very tall and uh, horizontal inclined uh, uh, terraces which are raised uh, due to erosion in any beach so yeah so coming to the formations is like these forms all types of uh, forms are due to coastal erosion for example you can see a stack over here so yeah so this is me standing beside a stack so uh, you get to see Uh, so caves sea caves are part of this entire coastal uh, so this is like a landscape so in a place where you go for example you go to a beach and you get to see all these elements and there has to be all these elements because they are formed together they were they have evolved one by one so so yeah so sea cave is not just the one thing which you get to see as an habitat but then there are a lot of other coastal cast forms and uh, such kind of uh, beautiful features you will get to see only in the uh, soft rocks which are like soluble rocks such as limestone and uh, yeah like i said earlier also that these are not form in like one year or two year these these require uh, erosion of like millions of years so uh, the quick examples like this is a sea arch at neil island so this you can see there's an arch and uh, yeah from england this is a very beautiful place called jurassic coast which has got a this really good very beautiful limestone sea arch and yeah this is a stack at an andaman again coming to coastal caves this was the most important documentation of a coastal landform so here you can see this is like a typical uh, example of a sea cave where you can see the gusling of water and as in yeah so this is how the cave is formed it's like continuous uh, wave action so this is how it gets eroded and a cave is formed so yeah coming to the how these coastal caves are formed so for example if you if you must you must have noticed like whenever we go to a beach we can see a huge inclined terrace so basically that is a bedrock and it has got a lot of fractures so and this is a large fault and these are like fractures smaller fractures 
then waves came come and erode the faults and fractures near the edges of the water and slowly uh, slowly means i mean it will take thousands of years and yeah the cave starts to become opening at the both ends forming an arch which you see in the seen saw in the last last slide and here you can see it is still forming a cave so finally what happens is this this upper portion collapses and leaves behind a sea stack sea stack so you can see the formation of caves also is happening the arch is also happening and along with the stack which is then left aside so these landforms they evolve together and then one by one so the most uh, i mean my most uh, remembered or most beautiful experience while studying is like surveying this cave i mean initially uh, when we started off uh, we had no idea how to begin and then slowly and steadily we we developed a we i mean like our team we developed the proper standard standardized protocol to how to do survey of the cave fauna so this is what you see is a standard survey protocol so as in we we like measure the cave and the, we always keep a 1 1 meter distance and those 1 1 meter transects are basically called as yeah transects and we call them as survey station so for example this is the first survey station this is the second survey station three and it, it goes off and this is always done in the center line of the cave as in you have to divide the cave into two halves like in imaginary and then you have to keep continue the survey so uh, in this process we take uh, this is l l route basically left right up and down we start to take such kind of uh, measurements till the end of the uh, cave and then we produce statistics like uh, statistics related to cave morphometry the end resulting statistics which are length cave area perimeter average inclination volume and a lot of other things like direction of the cave mouth and a lot of other things so and the basic thing is like in every transect we we perform this visu visual encounter method so this visual encounter method was used in coast these coastal cave setup but otherwise uh, it's always systematic and yeah there is a and yeah the most important reason that why do we go for visual encounter method is because there is a time constraint we always have to check for tides so for example if there is like a window of just two hours we have to hurry up and do the survey very quickly otherwise we will be stuck inside the cave for like yeah entire night so sorry but the i saw, there was a list of lot of researchers students so i thought of you know uh, also adding one technical slide to this presentation so okay so we did all such kind of surveys we got we got lot of numbers we got lot of statistics then what does that mean so basically statistics and morphology morphological measurements are required to identify the type of coastal cave so like i said we calculate the area perimeter and entrance width maximum width so these four uh, morphological uh, like measurements are very important to identify a coastal cave so for example you just cannot see your coastal cave and say okay this one is a littoral cave or this one is a sea cave there has to be mathematics involved uh, when you when you can actually confirm and tell that okay this this is a type of a cave so for example uh the first important ratio comes here is area per perimeter ratio so in ap ratio this is called ap ratio and ap ratio once you plot the area and perimeter of all the caves you should always get a straight trend line so this the straight trend line will always be for the sea caves so in here also this graph is basically caves from bahamas so you will see this trend line is also for the sea caves and the second ratio which is very important is entrance width to maximum width which is like like if the ratio is approximately 1 then there the size of the sea the sea caves is very small and if the ratio is like less than 1 then it is littoral it may be of littoral origin and may remnants of flank margin cave like i said so yeah so these systematics are involved when you identify a cave right so there are different systematics for inland caves and these are the systematics for coastal cave so coming to the biodiversity this is the favorite part of everyone So yeah, when when I was like, uh, we found like seven to eight coastal caves on Andaman Islands, and then uh, like I said to you guys, like we did this visual encounter method, and we found different indirect signs, and uh, they like these are of birds. So we also found bats. So mostly this was the bearded tombat, bearded tombat. Yes. So yeah, and then we had a lot of AV fauna which was using the entrance zone of the. So this is the lesser. 
the whistling duck which was found uh, while during the survey and yeah rodents were there in the dark and the twilight zones so in andamans uh, coastal caves in not in other andamans even in southeast asia uh, coastal caves are habitats to uh, glossy swiftlet like now it is called as plume toad swiftlet like with because it's endemic to andamans now so here in andamans uh, the coastal caves are habitat to plume toad swiftlet and andaman edible swiftlet also as, as in there are records before tsunami that there were nestings of edible swiftlet in uh, coastal caves on nicobar also so yeah so we also found a lot of uh, gastropod diversity a lot of arena uh, reptiles yeah lizards and definitely ants then uh, coming to a lot of lepidopterans crickets crab centipedes cockroach so a lot of lot of uh, diversity we found in these coastal caves so coming to uh, like we just recently uh, completed this uh, project uh, which was uh, in maharashtra so the basic objective of the study was again mapping the biological diversity of caves in bengal or oxar archipelago so i won't be like getting into the more of the mapping part uh, because that is in the process of publishing so yeah for obvious reasons so yeah so what are bengal rocks so bengal rocks um, is a beautiful archipelago which has 23 islands this is in sindhudurg maharashtra and we we could document two voids uh, voids as in which are just 2 meter or 3 meters uh, it, deep and which are not like 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 i said like it's not enough to humans to enter and not enough to explore so yeah so there are two caves which were documented and yeah again we use the standard survey protocol which i said but here it was uh, very systematically done and yeah the cave fauna survey was done using the transic method so coming to what what diversity we found uh, in this cave so like we found in andamans these are very diverse habitats So we found cockroaches, gastropods, arena, lepidopterans. Uh, lepidopterans uh, also are found in swiftlet guano, bat guano, because uh, we have read that a lot of moths uh, lay their eggs inside these guano, and then these these are like bagworms, which then feed on guano and then yeah then they become moth. So uh, yeah, so currently I am working on Indian swiftlet and. like my phd is also on breeding ecology of indian swiftlet and this bird is found in in this particular cave so uh, like uh, other coastal caves are also used by the other swiftlets like glossy and plume toad and edible nest swiftlet so here in maharashtra the sea cave is used by this beautiful bird indian swiftlet so indian swiftlet is a scheduled one species under wildlife protection act and like if there are birders and participants they'll understand that these this bird has a lot of history of illegal trafficking and illegal trafficking of the nest because this nest is used for making the soup in especially in southeast asia and there is a lot of uh, belief that this soup is uh, used in like treating at asthma and other skin uh, skin related issues and all it already also has a misbelief of and um, like understanding it is as an aphrodisiac so yeah so i mean this sea cave is very important for this bird as as in because this is the oldest colony and the biggest colony of uh, this bird in the entire world so what are the threats to coastal caves i mean this is not a coastal cave but then uh, because we don't in india we don't have more much caves coastal caves which are open for tourism so i had to show an inland cave basically so the first thing um, like my title of my uh, ppt also said that they are under under studied under explored so we need uh, a lot of scientific research and conservation efforts toward these these fragile habitats so yeah there is lack of lack of attention and that's why we 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 as in speleological association of india we keep we keep calling these habitats as under study and under explored and again if we if we come to inland and coastal both caves so there is a lot of irresponsible tourism uh, going on in our, in our country and also abroad and i'm just not blaming us but it's everywhere and secondly the vandalism so this is like a beautiful coastal uh, landform in hariharishwar maharashtra and you can see every uh, people are writing names of the family members who are deceased and this this comes in this comes in part of vandalism and i, I mean this shouldn't be motivated and uh, like allowed so uh, mining mining is an issue everywhere and for a lot of habitats so caves are also uh, 
caves are also like kind of vulnerable uh, due to these so yeah and then pollution so this picture is from andamans only so you can see that there is a lot of uh, plastic waste and uh, rubber waste so whenever we like throw anything in the ocean it just comes back and gets deposited in coastal caves this i'm talking specially about andaman nicobar islands so yeah these are this is the brief of threats i i mean everybody must be knowing more than these threats so yeah maybe we can take up these threats in the discussion later so uh, this this very exciting study i was reading about last month is uh, this is about a inland cave which is a show cave and uh, i was very surprised to see that there is like growing microplastic pollution in the cave sediments nowadays so as you can see like there's a lot of tourism going on in the show caves and like whenever we go inside we somehow take a lot of microplastics inside and what these guys did is they they took a lot of samples of the case sediments like of stalagmites and stalactites and did a lot of analysis and found found like uh, approximately 4390 kg of microplastics so i mean this is this is something very serious happening when it comes to caves and uh, yeah so and because this is very serious when it comes to caves because there are a lot of fauna inside caves which is not known yet to the science so yeah i mean uh, other than any other habitat any other habitat in this on this earth maybe caves are the most vulnerable yeah so yeah this can lead to a lot of things like uh, caste aquifer pollution uh, pollution then we have groundwater pollution coming up in the same thing then then speleothem damage and because they like i mentioned that these sediments and caves these are like uh, past repositories of a lot of past climatic changes which have happened and like how humans have evolved how this a particular geographic area has evolved so such kind of information you know it's not worth using then uh, yeah so ingestion by cave animals uh, there was a study which i read um, Uh, which said that the cave spiders in the webs of cave spiders they found uh, microplastics again so i mean this is like height of uh, plastic pollution and uh, yeah so damaging uh, it's in indirectly damaging paleontological and archaeological findings and yeah if you see it's threatening the entire ecosystem along with the flora fauna and yeah so indirectly us so uh, briefing up uh, coastal caves are are the biodiversity reservoirs and if we if we look at the global scenario uh, there has been documentation of 2167 taxa so recorded from 350 coastal caves in 15 countries and i'm sure that this would have been now increased because the, this is the old study so yeah so these are very significant bio, biodiversity reserves and reservoirs and as you can see that this is a mediterranean monk seal which is critically endangered now and it uses coastal caves in you uses coastal cave for pupping so i mean uh, the major part of reproduction of the for this monk seal is coastal caves so for example sea lions also in oregon coast i mean this cave is a show cave and now uh, they can see they can see a, a kind of a terrible uh, population decline in the sea lions now because of the increasing show, show tourism so yeah so this has to be uh, understood and uh, preserved so yeah so these kind of habitats especially coastal caves you know they deserve a lot of attention and further scientific research and conservation act conservation is required so yeah so this is this is like a slogan for today like you know let us all act today and let us all let us all act like together so together is like the, the most important thing which i wanted to say today like every everybody has to contribute their part and uh, we should we should be together coming up and like doing something for these very fragile habitats so when it comes to vengurla rock so now this is like self promotion time so uh, last year um, th there was a short documentary released on our work on the vengurla rocks so i'll request all the participants to definitely give a watch to it so yeah so yeah finally coming to acknowledgments i i acknowledge everybody who have been part of my journey including dr manji series who's my guide and dr golden and all my colleagues uh, prathamesh amruta sudhir puja assistants and all the participants and thank you everybody for you know you everybody just came up and you know uh, it was sort of a motivation for me i cannot stop talking about coastal caves and caves in general but yeah so today i'll stop and this is this i found a really 
uh, funny photo today that lies of caving. So there is a comics which is printed by National Philological Survey. And so this is like you don't need any knee pads. And then once we entered the cave, we found out that you know they actually, we actually need knee pads. So this is like so there, there are a lot of lies when it comes to caving. Now the first lie is you cannot uh, you can do it alone. So there's nothing uh, not caving and nothing you can do alone. So yeah, so that's why I wanted to thank so many people, MOFCC, Mango Foundation, everybody like they are they are the funding sources. So yeah, so we have to do everything together. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you so much. So we can come come to questions now. Thank you, Danusha, for that wonderful talk on coastal caves. Um, if anybody has any questions, please type them up in the chat box where you could even unmute yourself and ask. If there is anything any other participants would like to say. So, uh, yeah, so there is one question from DH Learning Studio. Hi, Anu. The, these microplastics are the ones we take with us into the case unknowingly. Yes, yes, Anu. We do take it with us unknowingly. So, for example, we are entering a cave with shoes, for example. So, our shoes will also contain a lot of microplastics. So yeah, so microplastics are like everywhere, and we take we just don't take it into case. We take take them to every each and every habitat. Nitin, hi, thank you for attending, man. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, hi, I'm sorry. Yeah, excuse me. Hi, thanks for the talk, Danusha. So thanks. you had mentioned that there were different stages of erosion that leads to different uh, types or like formations of certain caves, inside certain caves, right? Right. I was wondering when you're taking measurements of something, if it's ever been confusing where it seems like it might have been this type of a cave at some point, but now it's turning more into another type of a cave. So uh, this can happen. Because uh, what happened was a few years back we had a talk with you know the the person who has been studying uh, coastal caves for his entire life, and then he said to us that a lot of time if for example there is a guano pile of for example ten meters on the ground, so definitely there is cave like the the I mean the ground of the cave is way below the ten meters, so definitely there is an error when we are counting or we are when we whenever we are measuring these caves. But in coastal caves, what I what I've seen and like through my experiences, uh, such kind of changes just cannot happen uh, in like a, like in a year or a two, or maybe we we have to check it like from a hundred years uh, timeline. So I believe this this erosion cannot happen like so quickly. No, I I completely agree with that. What I meant yeah. was if you saw if you had ever reached any cave where you felt like the measurements told you that it's at a transitioning point or something like that. See, what happened first was that we had a very less sample size. Like, for example, we I just had seven. OK, so mm -hmm. right now, um, whatever numbers we have, we are confirmed and we are sure, OK, those are littoral caves and some are sea caves. But you know, once we get a lot of uh, big sample size and we keep on sampling the coastal caves of the entire India, so maybe, you know, like what you are saying, Maybe such kind of things can happen, like a lot of errors can come up and we have to refine the ratios again. For example, nobody has like made a different ratio for tropical caves. But then I and Dr. Shirish, when we were working on the coastal caves of Andamans, we actually realized that we need a different ratio for tropical caves later. So yeah, so we have to look into it. Thanks. That's what I want to know. Sure. Yeah, uh, you could ask a question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, two things. First of all, how do we identify a coastal cave? For example, if we are surveying the uh, coastal areas and it's a rocky shore, so how do we identify these caves if they are very prominent or uh, some, I mean, 
if you could uh, tell from on that and secondly i wanted to ask if there are any caves along the coast of kutch that you have explored or if not then of uh, um, you know like what are the places we could get issue where all the caves are or do we find in you know hi dhwani uh, i actually got your first question very clearly but the second question you know there was lot of breaking so can you just type in the chat box so by the time i'll answer your first question dhwani are you there so can you just type your second question you can answer the first question yeah i'll answer the first question and can you type the second question this is what i'm asking yes yes yeah so dhwani uh, coming to the first question so uh, for example you are walking on a beach a rocky rocky shore and you see that there are a lot of uh, holes okay so for example for a layman these are just holes so for example if it is uh, uh, i mean if the entry is okay for a human to for a human to enter kind of it's if the entrance is okay you should first check and the length is the first thing when we check like this is the first thing Uh, when we see to classify it as a void or a cave so i mean uh, i forgot to mention that the uh, minimum uh, length of a cave basically should be 5 5 meters and these definitions keep on changing internationally but then uh, what we understand here is uh, it should be 5 meters uh, a human should be able to enter and less than 5 meters is considered to be a void so yeah so if you if you are walking through a rocky shore you can easily say that what is a void and what is a cave Yeah, and then yeah, are there any caves in Kutch, Gujarat? So I have read a couple of papers which uh, mention this thing. So along with uh, sea caves, there are a lot of other coastal landforms also, and voids also. So I'll just I'll share just share my email ID. You can write to me, and I'll share the paper with you. So there are caves. Yeah. Can I can I just give an input for this? Uh, yes, sir, please. because recently uh, i was reading about uh, gujarat and kutch region basically so in kutch uh, we have a huge caste form uh, caste land forms where definitely there will be lot of limestone caves uh, not on the coast little uh, inland uh, and hopefully like uh, presently from saffron we are planning some work and if that gets funded we will be soon exploring some of those caves so this is just for an information but yeah there are many caves definitely that's what i feel uh, adding to this sir i also re- read a i read a paper which had a lot of caves on like same like saurashtra coast so there are a lot of mm-hmm. platforms and yeah so there yeah. are a lot of caves yeah. mm-hmm. thank you dwani uh, i hope you are Satisfied with the answers? Yes, there is one more question. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. Don't be. <laughs> I was sorry. asking. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, no. I was asking. Uh, what are the various uh, resources that we can refer to? Because I research. Um, I mean, I work with the communities along the coast uh, on environmental conservation. So, in case I need more information on, you know, like where all there are caves and what all do we find in them. Um. So, if you could share some resources. yeah sure i mean but there are a lot of resources i mean uh, when it comes to scientific articles reports the sacon itself has a lot of reports uh, when it comes to cave fauna and cave mapping and cave morphometry and and there are a lot of uh, freely available reports also on on you can like you can search on google scholar or any other uh, like site and yeah like i said i'll share my email id so you can you can be in touch we'll keep on sharing uh, resources with you and coming to one more thing we don't have a, a kind of a documentation of caves in india all over india so so this i mean this paleological thing is in process now like uh, it's not document like every state or every country has their own documentation process and so india is right now in a process i mean not like on paper but yeah we we keep on documenting a lot of caves from different regions so you are also welcome to contribute to this thing Sure. Thank you so much. It was good. Yeah. Thank uh, you. In continuation with that, there is one more question in the chat box asking if any mapping of the ent- entire Indian caves has been done. 
no especially for that is that okay hi shiva so uh, the, no so this is not happened and yeah so this is a dream project basically that we need to map all the caves of Ind- india and basically our entire subcontinent so yeah so is mapping done so no the answer is no not the entire Thank caves you. Will, yeah. yeah but Thank you me. you can actually take up and start documenting them <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Next one is from Mr. Rajesh. Uh, have you come across any fruit bats in coastal regions? So, uh, no fruit bats as such. Like we just found this uh, bearded tomb bat, which I, there was a picture. So, no, no, not other species. Like not the frugivores and yeah. So mostly insectivores species. But just one species I found during the survey. and in maharashtra also we never documented any bat species in the sea cave so rajesh i mean is it oh, yeah thanks is sure. rajesh one then yeah but yeah. Uh, you know there, there are a lot of resources i mean uh, abroad maybe there are a lot of studies especially in bahamas so if you can check uh, some research articles uh, if in the sea caves of bahamas i think they have a good documentation of bat species from there Okay. So yeah, that would help you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Usha uh, asks that I just curious: Are the coastal caves openings faced mostly towards ocean, or are they facing away too? Uh, yeah, so they mostly face uh, towards the ocean because you know, like I said, the erosion due to a wave action, so it has to be faced uh, towards the sea. but then if we come to uh, rocks such as these vengula rocks uh, they can be any any side of the rocks or any side of the island because then yeah because it's an island in mainland india it is definitely they should be facing the sea i think we so, already yeah. not have any information on the particular species of bat preferring coastal caves Yeah, I think we just uh, answered this. Yeah. 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 Uh, does Dhani Then, Dhani have another question? She has her hand raised. Yeah, Dhani. Oh no no, uh, I have I forgot to uh, lower that. Okay, so Usha has a question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Usha. also what floral diversity did you observe near the entrance zone so uh, when it comes to coastal caves uh, there is lot of wave action uh, keep, which keeps on happening and basically that uh, that avoids or you know that is the reason why floral, floral diversity is not there but then uh, you, we definitely found some good algae and uh, yeah algae was definitely there yeah, especially on the walls not not obviously in the pools and all yeah but yeah so th- i mean this is very interesting if uh, somebody can take up and look it into the algal diversity so not not like trees and stuff as such but when it comes to the shore parts you will always get to see some mangrove associates or yeah such kind of uh, plants uh, near the entrance zone but not exactly inside the cave i mean just in the ecotonal region where yeah sea and cave there is a transit zone So only in that region you will get to see such kind of diversity. Yeah, Amrita. So do we? Yeah. Any more questions? Anybody? You could please leave your feedback in the link that I am sharing in the chat box right now. and also let us know what what else you want to hear from speleological association of india so we would love to have your uh, i mean suggestions for our upcoming webinars so definitely write to us if there are no further questions then i think we can uh, close for today
yeah so i would just take this opportunity to, to thank ganusha once again for an amazing talk on coastal caves which gave us a very good introduction not only about uh, caves and their formation in general but also about specific caves in andaman and uh, the konkan region of maharashtra and we hope that we'll have more such talks uh, specifically about caves and thank you everyone for joining us and hope to see you again in our next talks if if anybody would like to catch up on any of the previous webinars that we've done before i am sharing here once again a few more links uh, that you can look up thank you so much thank you all so yeah maybe leave the meeting yeah